Welcome back to this final segment of this law session of English Legal Systems looking at the uh, statutory interpretation aspect of the English legal system. Now we have covered a fair bit of ground in the last three segments and at the last break we touched on or rather I touched on very briefly uh, the purpose of approach. I do want to carry on here though by saying that when you look at the purpose of a approach and it looking at the purpose behind the legislation, one of the cases which by and large is important in this area is a case of Pepper and Hart. Uh, Pepper and Hart is a 1993 case which suggests that or rather enables the court to look at Hansard where they can consider the law uh, in its context because of course Hansard is all of the debates in Parliament and look at what exactly has happened going through Parliament and so if there's an ambiguity it may very well be clarified by that and so that goes towards the purposive approach as well. I did also mention in previous sections about uh, all bills and acts coming out of uh, 90, since 1999 uh, which of course give the explanatory notes and this somewhat provides for the purpose being considered. Now, when you look at a case like Pixon and Freeman uh, in relation to equal treatment, the purposive approach was taken there. Also in a case of uh, uh, RV Registrar General Ex parte Smith in 1990, and we do also see the court in Cutter and Eagle Star considering precisely uh, this approach to be taken. Let's look at the cases. When we look at Pixton and Freeman, the Court of Appeals said that Article 119 of the Treaty of Rome and Equality, uh, as it relates to treatment for men and women, was clear and could be applied directly. So they assumed that Parliament's intent was, of course, to comply with EU law. Now look at how it was considered in Registrar General Ex parte Smith. Well, this had to look at Section 51 of the Adoption Act 1976, which enabled a person to obtain a birth certificate when he reached the age of 18, but it was subject to certain conditions. So if you're adopted, Section 51 said you could get your original birth certificate with your birth parent's name on it. Now, Smith had wanted a certificate in order to find his mother. The problem, of course, was you'd think that that was a nice thing, but he was actually a very dangerous murderer, and he was in Broadmoor Mental Hospital. Now, the literal rule, of course, would say that he could have the birth certificate, but if you looked at the purposive approach, which has been applied uh, since Parliament could never have intended to promote such serious crime, the point here being, is he going to look for his mother to kill her? Now, the point is that the courts taking a purposive approach said, we don't think so. Now, Cutter and Eagle Star 1998, which we touched on before regarding the insurance company and whether you're on a road or not. I am always sympathetic to law students when they have to do exams because I always say to them, when you look at certain cases, if it is that you have law lords having problems with it, what say the law student? Because when you look at Cutter, here we had the Court of Appeal who had decided that the car park was a road for the purposes of the Road Traffic Act. So actually the Court of Appeal took a purposive approach discussion to it. But the House of Lords in reversing it, so the House of Lords basically slapped the Court of Appeal judges on their wrists and say, no, you can't do that. You must look at the literal rule. So we do see that, yes, from a purposive approach standpoint, arguably the finding would have been that the car park was a road, but from a literal standpoint, no. And the House of Lords said no. And of course, the insurance company is the one with the money, so they are going to take it to the House of Lords. Now, the purpose of approach is one that will promote the general legislative purpose which underlies the provisions of the Act. And we see that um, being said there. That, of course, there will be a comparison of uh, looking at the meaning, looking at the purpose. In fact, when you look at it from the EU perspective, they talk about this teleological approach, which is more or less a fancy word for saying the purpose of approach in my view. When you look at a case like Jones and Tarboot, uh, Tarboot rather, in 1997, the complainant had suffered racial abuse at work, which he said 
amounted to racial discrimination for which the employers were liable under the Race Relations Act. Now, the Court of Appeal applied the purposive approach and said that the acts of discrimination were committed in the course of employment. Now, the argument, of course, was that it wasn't necessarily the employer who was committing these racial abuse, but how it was done, the courts considered that it was within the course of his employment. Now, what are the pros and cons? Well, certainly the pro or the advantage when you look at the purpose of approach is that it gives effect to the true intent of Parliament. The downside, of course, is that it can only be used if a judge can find Parliament's intention in the statute or in the parliamentary material. Equally, the downside also involves judges having this ability to rewrite the law, more or less, because, of course, the judges um, are going to say, well, this must have been what Parliament intended. We see Sir Rupert Cross in his statutory interpretation, 3rd edition, 1995, saying that when you look at the approach, it is not that the judges look at a case and decide this is what we're going to do. He says the judges begin by using the grammatical and ordinary or technical meeting of the context and the, of the statute. And if it produces an absurd result, then they may, uh, may apply a secondary meaning. The judges may also imply words into the statute or alter or ignore words to prevent a provision from being unintelligible, un unworkable or absurd. And when they apply the rules, they may of course resort to various aids. I would urge you to bear in mind the impact of the EU, we've touched on that briefly, and certainly further to the European Communities Act 1972, you must of course, uh, as a court, take on board uh, the statutes or the legislation coming out of the EU when you look at matters in relation to their competence. Equally, when you look at the Human Rights Act, please bear in mind Section 3.1, of the Human Rights Act requires that legislation is to be read in a way which is compatible with convention rights so far as it is possible to do so and where it is not possible to give an interpretation that is compatible with the convention then a declaration of incompatibility may be issued. So we see that there is this section 3 issue in relation to uh, the Human Rights Act. Now, when you're looking at legislative provisions, there are, of course, separate from the rules, there may, of course, be other principles of construction which a court may, of course, take on board when it is being guided. Now, the legislation may be considered in its entirety. So you may look at the piece of legislation to see what is it about. Secondly, there is what is called the use them generous rule, which may be applied when a list of specific words is used, which together could be said to form a class or a genus. And at the end of the list is a general word or phrase. So for example, dogs, cats, rabbits, and any other animals. Well, when you look at the list of the specific words, the fact that there's dogs, the fact that there's cats, the fact that there's rabbits, could be said to form a genus, a class, domestic four-legged pets. Now, the general word or phrase at the end, any other animals, is a catch-all, which is a, a catch-all provision or, or, or phrase, which if interpreted li literally, would include, uh, for example, um, other types of animals, but may exclude things like wild animals and birds. Now, the use of generous rule applies to limit the scope of the general word or phrases so that it comes within the ambit of the class which has been created by the specific words. So if the rule is applied in this example, then the class created by the specific words could be domestic four-legged pets. That's how you read it. So any other animal would be part of that class. There are certain presumptions in law which may apply when you're looking at reading into a statute. Also, where there are conflicting provisions with the same piece of legislation, the court is required to decide which of the conflicting provision is dominant or the leading provision. And the court may, of course, look and say, well, the non-dominant provision will then have to give way to the dominant provision. When you're looking at delegated legislation, the court may interpret it in such a way that it does not exceed the power set out uh, for the persons who are supposed to be legislating.
you have to look at conflict with the EU, for example. And so when you look at these aids, the, they can be classified variously. Internal aids are aids which appear within the official copy of the legislation. The long title is the formal title which is given to the act. Uh, uh, for example, um, when you look at the theft act, you look at the long title. Now, in the case of R.V. Galvin, 1987, we see that Galvin acquired restricted Ministry of Defense documents. Uh, when he was charged under the Official Secrets Act, he said that the documents had ceased to be secret and had never actually been official, which he said is what the title of the act demanded, Official Secrets Act. Well, the court said, you are guilty because the section referred only to documents and the title is no more than a label. Now, his conviction was quashed on other grounds, but for the purposes of that, it does stand. Now, the short title is also there, used for reference. So when you look at the Treasure Act, for example, um, we see that you have a short title in that. So as I say, these internal aids assist. There may be schedules within the act. Preambles can be very useful as well. Now, one of my favorite preambles is um, the, the preamble to the uh, when you do charitable trusts later on in year two or three and you see the preamble to the statute of elizabeth and it talks about what is a charity i think it's really fun but it does have this long archaic language in it but preambles can be very important in showing you what it means marginal notes uh, are simply summaries of particular sections within the legislation they don't form part of the le legislation they cannot be used as an aid to legislative interpretation. I've already talked about definitions. We've already looked at those. Now, external aids may be used. External aids, we're looking at things like the Interpretation Act of 1978, which tells you how to look at the act. You can use a dictionary. A case that's very important is a case called Mandland Dowell Lee. Now, this is where you had a controversial instance of statutory interpretation. Now, the courts, both of them, the House of Lords and the Court of Appeal, were divided on the application of statute and the Race Relations Act. Now, it is one that Lord Denning was sitting in as well, so it's no surprise there. The interpretation was on ethnic in respect of Sikhs and whether ethnic formed a, 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 a class as such. Well, in the case a boy was excluded from school for wearing a turban, a question of law was raised whether a Sikh fell within the Race Relations Act 1976. Now, the statute um, intrinsic aid defined race as including ethnicity. But what does that mean? Well, the House of Lords used a dictionary, an extrinsic, a extrinsic aid, and eventually decided ethnicity refers to a long shared history from a particular religion. Hence, the ratio from Manley and Dowie Lee now binds law courts in relation to what ethnicity mean. The Law Commission, as a source, may be relevant as well. Reports on parliamentary debates may also be relevant uh, uh, as a source in respect of an external source. So you can see what was discussed. We uh, mentioned, of course, about Hansard. And by and large, uh, the point that I want to end on is to say to you, when you look at this whole idea of statutory interpretation, then you should look at it in the context of the development of the common law. You will have seen, of course, that we have discussed in a previous law session uh, the whole context of precedent. Well, the doctrine of, the, of precedent provides that any previous uh, decision uh, of a court, uh, well, depending on its position in the hierarchy of the courts, is binding on a subsequent judge or a subsequent court. So what I want you to do is to be able to see how these two areas uh, actually gel together and you can see, for example, the Mandland Dowell Lee case, which has to do with statutory interpretation, will certainly see that it binds courts below it. Now, the point for you to bear in mind is that as you go through this, you should know the hierarchy of the courts. I will certainly refer you back to precedent and say you cannot do a question which would ask you, for example, uh, judges make law discuss without bringing parts of both of these two areas into play and looking at how not only precedent is made, but how judges have interpreted what parliament has laid down. That, of course, brings us to the end of statutory interpretation.
and I would certainly ask you to join me for future law sessions uh, under the English legal systems or common law reasoning institutions head depending on what it is termed in your syllabus.